everyone. I'm Ione Butler and I'm the founder of Uplifting Content. Haven't done an interview for a few days, so I'm really excited to introduce you all to Charles, Charles Eisenstein. Morning or even afternoon, Charles. How are you today? I'm doing well. Awesome, awesome. So rather than me do bio introductions, because normally I kind of butcher them and don't always say the right thing, or whatever people want to say, um, I'd love for you just to share with our audience um, a bit about yourself and what it is that you do, please. Well, I'm a, uh, I'm a writer, a speaker, uh, former Olympic heavyweight wrestler. What? <laughs> I think you're pulling my leg. <laughs> that always, yeah, somehow that always gets left out of the bio. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a student. <laughs> really, really, what I am is a writer. That's yeah. that's my primary profession. And then sometimes I speak about the things I write about, and uh, you know, like do the things that writers tend to do, like uh, hold retreats sometimes and, and stuff like that. But mostly, um, and what I write about is mostly one way to understand it is the transition in our culture's deep stories, the mythology that tell us who we are, why we're here, how to be a person, what's important, how the world works, like all that is changing. Mm. And the old stories and the systems built on those stories are falling apart. Mm. And the new ones haven't really formed. So that's kind of the, the transition that I write about. Yes, and we'll talk more about that because that's fascinating. Um, also, everybody that is on the live, um, I'll be giving away one of Charles's books, uh, The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible. Um, and so comment your lead comments, say hello, ask a question, and we'll pick somebody and I will send you uh, one of his books so we can, we can chat about that too, which will be fantastic. Um, so, so many things to, to delve in about. Um, first of all, What's your story? How did you get to, um, to sort of writing about this type of stuff and the workshops that you lead? Uh, where did that come from? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I could, maybe I could like make up the answer that is the most impressive. No, be genuine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, like why, yeah, why do I do the things I do? I, I've, was there, I guess a, I had, was there a journey? Did it, had you always been in tune with this? Was it a discovery at some point? I always had a sense that there was something deeply wrong about the world that had been offered to me as normal. Mm -hmm. I'm not unique in having this feeling. I think more and more uh, young people have that feeling that there's supposed to be something more than this. For me, it started off maybe in school looking out the window, looking at the worksheet that had been put in front of me, thinking this is, I wouldn't have used the word bullshit at the time, but, <laughs> but like this, it can't be this. And, and why are we locked in this room? And I had a secret sympathy for the bad kids in the classroom, but all of the authority figures in my life told me in various ways that, that a good boy does his homework, gets good grades, gets into a good college, plays the game, follows the story. And I didn't have a lot of allies for this deep-seated feeling that there's something wrong in the world or that the world is supposed to be more beautiful, more meaningful, more uh, intimate, more fulfilling than what had been offered me. But I had some allies. And I think then maybe this is what propelled me into doing what I do. I had, I came across various books that confirmed my feelings that were like radical political books. Which um, ones? Island Spring, A People's History of the United States. Things that, that said, yeah, Charles, like you shouldn't just accept this. So that's what launched um, an inquiry that lasted maybe 20 years. And in some sense is still ongoing. What's the origin of the wrongness? And mm -hmm. then leading that, it led to answers that were so deep that I realized that the wrongness that I was seeing is part of a larger process, part of a larger wholeness, part of a process of growth followed by 
crisis, followed by breakdown, followed by an empty space, an unknowing, followed by the emergence of something new. And, and so I, I, the way that I work now today is to try to serve the, whatever new story, whatever new mythology wants to emerge. And then I apply that, apply it to different political issues, social issues, environmental issues. Mm -hmm. So can you give us an example of, of a story, like an example of one of these stories, a new mythology, like something that you, that maybe you're looking at right now that you can mm -hmm. relate to modern, modern times? Yeah, yeah. I, so I just wrote a book on climate change that's now in the Climate publishing. change, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, it's in the publishing pipeline. Uh, and so in the old story, Earth is here for us. It's composed of a bunch of resources that we try to put to best use. Mm -hmm. It's not a being in its own right. So environmental ethics in that story are, well, what will be the consequences to human beings if we destroy and ruin nature? The climate change conversation is mostly about that. It's about the bad things that'll happen to us mm. if we don't change our ways. In my book, I make the point that, that that's not good enough to more cleverly dispose of the resources out there. Where we really need to go is to understand that Earth is a living being, that all of its subsystems are living beings. And we're being invited into a state of love where we don't just care about the bad things that will happen to us, mm. but we care about every being on this Earth. The soil, the water, the river, the lake, the, the mountain, uh, every, even every small piece of land. And that when we enter that state of care, then and only then will we do the things that will contribute to a healthy climate. Mm -hmm. So it's not about emissions, really. Mm -hmm. That's the wrong conversation to be having. Uh, it's, or, or if to the extent that it's about emissions, it's an invitation into deeper questions. Mm. So that would be, a, yeah, an example. Very, very cool. So with the, with the, like you were saying, when you were at school and you kind of felt that there was a, a wrongness, where do you think, for, for me, I see it as kind of us being led toward um, the individual, me, 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 at the expense of everybody else, um, sort of uh, uh, competition, I think, and it's really prevalent in the US as well, um, like having... Um, those are the things that I kind of think are, are the wrongness of the messages. What, what, what would be from your investigation and the stuff that you were looking into, what, what was that that you kind of have discovered and have been looking at? For yeah. Years? Like, so that competition, that's definitely one layer of it. It's a mentality that's fostered um, by the economy, mm. by school. Like school is fundamentally competitive. When you're put with a bunch of people your own age, and you're given rewards that go to some and not others. And if I get an A and you get a B or a C, then I'm higher ranked than you. So if I help you get good grades in this competitive environment, then I'm sacrificing something for, for myself. So it's mm -hmm. basically anti-cooperation, the whole system. Mm -hmm. And it's practice for the economy in which there's systemically always more debt than there is money. So we're always in competition with each other for never enough. Nice. So it's not just a psychology and it can't be addressed only with spiritual practices. It's also a system. The psychology manifests as a system. But it also goes deeper than that. The economy and the school system, that could go on and on, the medical system, political system, agricultural system, all of these things sit very comfortably in a deeper ideology or a deeper mythology that goes all the way to who are you? What is it to be? What is it to exist? Mm -hmm. And it says who you are is a separate self mm -hmm. in an objective universe. Right. So of course, what happens to me need not affect what happens to you. Right. What happens to people in Bangladesh or Somalia doesn't have to affect you. You can build a wall and keep them out. You can, you can, if there's ecosystem destruction somewhere, 
that's okay. You can get your food somewhere else. You can protect yourself. You can isolate yourself because you're not interconnected with all things. Mm -hmm. That's what the old story says. So if you take that for granted, then everything that is familiar to us in our culture is also pretty much unchangeable. And the change has to go to the level of saying, yeah, who am I? I'm not a separate self. I'm the totality of my relationships. I am the holographic map of the whole universe. Everything that I do will have an impact on all things and come back to me somehow. Mm -hmm. Anything that happens to you or to the whales, like if, if whales go extinct or elephants go extinct, something in me is going to die too. Even if I can still procure enough food and shelter, mm -hmm. I will be poorer for your poverty. I will be poorer for the poverty of biodiversity because we're all interlinked, interconnected and interexistent. How did you discover this? I mean, I'm not the first person who's, who's thought of this. It's, it's, no, but I think we all have our, the, the, we can be told things, but the understanding, there's normally like a, either a process or a discovery yeah. where we can actually understand it as rather than just a concept is like, oh no, I, I, I get it. I am not, I am yeah. a separate individual. Yeah, like I'm not one of those people who had some incredible near-death experience or mystical awakening or encounter with a, hundred-year-old llama in a cave. Um, Aw, never mind. <laughs> not yet, anyway. But I think that this understanding is kind of ri it's like a rising water table that makes these perceptions more and more available to people who are pretty ordinary, like me. Like, I'm not like some super, you know, amazing avatar. Like, I'm, you know, I mean, I grew up like a middle-class white person in America, you know, like nothing that special yet these perceptions are available to me and to many other people like when i when i say these things people are like yeah yeah i've been thinking that it's it's a consciousness that's ready to be born mm -hmm. so that's one answer and the other answer is simply that that and this again is true for anyone if you hold a question in your mind long enough and persistently enough then it will attract answers to it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's not that I've figured out the answers, but that my curiosity brought the answers to me because they're out there now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Got it. So you held it in your mind. Yeah, like or it wouldn't or it held me. Like I, it, mm. you know, I just, got it. Nothing else really made sense if that question was still hanging there. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what is, I'm just curious, I like to get people's definition or explanation. What is your explanation of enlightenment or definition or how would you describe it? Uh, I, I like to kind of reframe that concept and rehabilitate the word. Okay. Um, before it had this spiritual meaning of some kind of complete liberation from attachment or from the cycle of reincarnation or absolute awareness or something like that. It was used um, in a more mundane way in phrases like an enlightened ruler um, or an enlightened policy or an enlightened relationship. Mm -hmm. And it refers more than to a process than to an absolute state. And for me, it would be the process of of the bringing of new things into the light of awareness. Things that had been hidden in shadow, unknown, become visible. Mm -hmm. And as that process unfolds, you could say that we become more enlightened because our awareness has expanded. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's a thing that you can say one person is more enlightened than another. What happens is that each of us walk a particular life path that brings certain things into awareness while other things remain hidden. Mm -hmm. So you and I might think ourselves quite enlightened and that we get it and we're conscious and evolved because we understand certain things. Unlike those UKIP voters or those Trump voters or those whoever who just don't get it and they're just totally ignorant, but they might be 
they're following a different path and they might be becoming aware of things that are totally off our map. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So right. it's like, it's like the, I mean, this might get a little bit metaphysical, but it's like, if you could imagine like a human collective oversoul, a collective being, that says, okay, I'm gonna split up into 8 billion pieces. So each one of us can walk a different path mm. and then tie these threads back together. That's beautiful. Mm. Well, I was doing a Facebook Live a little while back and one of the, a couple of the guys on the page had suggested a book called The Egg. It's a short story called The Egg. Have you heard of it or read it or mm. seen the little video about it? No. And it's about a guy that dies and goes to heaven and speaks to God. And basically God says that you, you will keep going. You will be every, you'll, you'll be every being in existence and you'll right. keep going and experiencing every existence of every person until you've learned everything, which I guess might take a while. Um, and so it transcends time and dimensions and all sorts of stuff like that. But yeah, very much uh, yeah. that's what you said there is beautiful. Yeah, that's the basic idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, let me see. It's all right. I'm trying to see if I can get some of these. Uh, now I'm doing it through Zoom. I'm seeing if I can get some of the comments on the Facebook. Um, we've got a couple. Oh, wait, what's going on here? Um, no, not really. Um, so guys, if you've got any questions for Charles, um, I'll be sending you a copy of his book, which will be a nice segue so we can talk about that. Um, the, was this the last one? You're writing one about um, climate change, which you mentioned. Um, and the last one was that the, the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Yep. Uh, was that the last one? Um, so yeah, I will be sending one of you um, that book. So yeah, I would love to, to tell, it's a, it's a fascinating title. Please tell me more about it. <laughs> well, I was, I was, um, it's related to what I was saying at the beginning, this feeling that the world is supposed to be more beautiful. Mm. And, and yeah, like the world's beautiful. Like I'm not saying that, that I'm not seeing the beauty around me, but when I drive down the typical, you know, four lane busy street in my country and look at all the buildings, um, like, man, we could do, after 5,000 years of architecture, <laughs> you know, like, can't we do better than this? Oh, my the goodness, The strip yes. malls, the big box yes. stores. Yeah. That, that, that's definitely an American thing. Like, and as you know, I think it is everywhere, and it's so sad. Like, the city of London is the most beautiful, magical place in the world for me. Like, because you can just see history, and you can see, mm -hmm. it's kind of sad that it's this, like, old Tudor building with, like, a Starbucks in it. But you're like, whatever, at least they kept the building right. there. And so when I used to travel to the States a lot, I was just like, what is wrong with this country? Like freeway, 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 like horrible industrial mall and a bunch of random stuff. Freeway, freeway, yeah. freeway. And so you're right. Yeah. So it should be more beautiful. Right. But even, even in London, like what's more beautiful, the older buildings or the newer buildings? I mean, I love the older ones. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, and, yeah, and I had a friend say that actually, people don't seem to build or make things to last anymore. Like everything is so, no one really thinks, is it, how is this gonna be in a hundred years? It just seems like with products and architecture, right. like how does it fit in? So, so we have a, have a system that comes through in architecture, but it's more general than that, that values quantity. Mm. So we've become very good at building hum humongous, buildings with lots of square feet at a minimum price. But the qualitative aspect has been ignored. We really can't see it very much. Mm -hmm. And to make the building aesthetically tolerable, then you, you build it as cheaply as possible and then you festoon it with some pillars, you know, and some like decorations. And you think that that is gonna make up for its fundamental ugliness. And like, I'm not, this isn't like an aesthetic thing that I'm writing about in the book. It's just, that's just a symptom of a much deeper condition. It's the same thing if I, if I just look at the fact that a third of all children grow up with abuse in this country. Wow. Or one in six children goes hungry every year in this country. And this is supposed to be the richest country on earth. Or... Uh, the growing inequality of wealth or the, the fact that half the coral reefs are dead or that we have half the number of trees that we had before civilization started or that the Aral Sea is like a tenth of its former extent or that the last giant wetlands in the Sahel 
is about to be destroyed through hydroelectric projects that will divert the water that feeds it and create these mega dams that will then get carbon credits. Like even the solutions are part of the problem. <laughs> so, 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 so the mind then sometimes goes into despair because the forces that are arrayed toward the maintaining and accelerating of the status quo seem so powerful that I don't know if you've ever entered these moments of despair where you look at the scope of the problems on this earth and, you know, what, what, what can I possibly do about it? Mm-hmm. But where the mind says that things will never really change, the heart knows that there's a possibility of a more beautiful world. And that's where the title of the book comes. It says, we have to accept this knowledge and navigate by it when the mind gives up and doesn't know what to do. Right. Right. Yeah. Because like on some level, you know it's possible. You know, you see like some beautiful project somewhere, some beautiful social enterprise or some gathering you go to or some regenerative farm. And you're like, yeah, the world could be built on this. Mm -hmm. Or even some beautiful, generous person. Mm -hmm. You're like, yeah. If, If everybody knew what this person knew, if everybody could occupy this, then the world's problems would disappear in a matter of years. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's not that hard. A beautiful world isn't that far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's impossible and easy at the same time. <laughs> it's, it's funny because I, I, I do get very overwhelmed with all the kind of issues and the struggles of the world. And the reason for creating uplifting content was um, a place to be reminded of that, of all these incredible things that people are doing. Because for whatever reason, we like to fixate, or not we like to, we're, we're constantly bombarded with all the bad stories and all the things that drag us down rather all these incredible stories and so um so yeah i I definitely think that's possible and i I was in a a state of despair a few years ago and just after watching all these documentaries i was like how did there's so many things going wrong i don't know what to do about it and my friend just said i only be the change you want to see in the world that's all you can do change you do what you can um and that's control what I can control. And so, and so that really helped put it in perspective. Mm-hmm. But you're right, it's, it's everybody doing their part. And even if it's just a few people doing their part, it's doing their part, it's having an impact. So who has been, actually, let me see if we've got a question. Um, Aisha says, do you sometimes have moments where you want to put something in words, but you can't, like it feels almost impossible. So um, there's that. And then my add on to that is, yeah, what's your process like with writing? Is it, is it divine inspiration? Do you struggle sometimes? Do you ever get blocked? Okay, so yeah, something I want to put into words and I can't find the words. Yeah, when that happens. I mean, hopefully that doesn't happen when I'm trying to write, but often <laughs> in life situations, you know, maybe words aren't actually the right way to to um, act on a feeling or, or an insight. Maybe there are other ways that are nonverbal. Mm-hmm. We, I think that, I mean, I grew up with this theory of change that I have come to question that says that the way to solve the big problems is you come up with a solution and then you persuade everybody else that your solution is right. And then you all act on this. Then you make a plan and then you you all execute the plan. And so you have lots and lots of smart people arguing about what the solution is. And they never even get to the stage where where someone's been, where everyone's been persuaded of the smartest guy's plan. Mm -hmm. That, That never happens. Instead, they just argue and argue and argue and argue. So... When, as I learn about myself and the world and the understanding sinks in, I may not always be able to articulate it, but the, when the knowledge and experiences inhabit me, I find myself saying and doing different things. And it's not even that I have to like necessarily make much of a effort to change. It's that I am changed by the conversations I've had, 
by the experiences I've had, by the people who have impacted my life. Mm -hmm. Now, I happen to have a gift for language and for translating things into words. And that's why I write books and, and stuff like that. But I don't think really that the way to change the world the most is that you get a big platform and reach lots of people. That's, I mean, it's one way and, and it happens to be what my gifts are suited for. But I believe that the small invisible acts are equally important that never get celebrated in public. Like I, I, I think of Nelson Mandela, someone who everybody agrees had a huge impact on the world because he was, he was known by hundreds of millions of people. He ultimately became president of South Africa. So of course he was a very influential, important person more so than your grandmother or my grandmother, right? Like we, we're accustomed to thinking in that quantitative way. But if you really think about it, you could ask, why was Nelson Mandela the person who he was? Maybe it was because of his grandmother. Mm -hmm, Maybe mm -hmm. he was an extraordinary person who gave him just what he needed to, to become the leader that he was. Mm -hmm. so maybe the most important person in the history of South Africa wasn't Nelson Mandela. Maybe it was his grandmother. <laughs> really maybe great it point. Was her grandmother. Yeah. And who's going to have the biggest impact on a 500 year time scale? Is it going to be Iona with her big online platform or Charles with his not so big, but you know, somewhat large audience, or is it going to be the single mom down the street who in difficult circumstances is maintaining love and patience and taking care of her children and giving them just like a little bit more than they would have gotten. And they pass that on. And in 10 generations, there are extraordinary people. Like maybe that woman is having a bigger impact than you and I. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The world doesn't work according to the arithmetic that we've learned. Right. And, and right. that's another part of what I was talking about before, navigating according to a different logic yeah heart logic so with that said then who has been um who who were your what about your grandparents um mm -hmm. who's been your in in inspiration or or yeah your support people that have helped guide you so we can credit them and not you <laughs> yeah I, mean, I, I i encounter people sometimes that mm. it's almost like they're they're angels come to earth yeah like gosh i mean we had a, a a garbage man a garbage collector back where i used to live 15 years ago who was just i mean maybe i'm imagining it but he radiated peace mm. and like i looked up from the window and he was looking right at me and he just like gave me this most beautiful smile and that signaled something to me. It, it, it communicated something to me on a soul level that mm -hmm. I have trouble putting into words, but it could very well be that without that encounter, I would be less effective at what I do, or I would get caught up in the success pursuit or something. Mm -hmm. But it's like, man, this guy is a garbage man. He's, whatever happened to his ambitions when he was a boy, what did he want from life? It probably wasn't to be a garbage man. Yet he's joyful. He's peaceful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, so that, I mean, I could draw out some logic around it, but it was all contained in that moment. And, and yeah, I could, I could, you know, I've had people like that just kind of brush against my life mm -hmm. that, delivered uh, an important piece of information to me. Mm -hmm. Information meaning something that comes in and, and forms me. So I think that perhaps the reason that we don't find great spiritual masters t in teaching positions, and when we do find them, then it turns out that they're like abusing children or, you know, yeah. doing all kinds of horrible things <laughs> or 
suspect things, <laughs> you know, they're like not mm-hmm. really better than anybody else. Like mm-hmm. maybe the great avatars are hidden. They're garbage men, they're lunch ladies. They're, that's what we called the cafeteria workers when I was a kid, lunch ladies. They're, you know, home care aides who go and like change bedpans, you know, they're, mm-hmm. they're hidden away because they're like, yeah, it's time for you guys to step up and we'll be in the background signaling to you uh, humility, signaling to you peace, generosity, but you have to do the work now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I, I just, I love, I love, I, for me, it's like when I encounter somebody like that, joy, I just love meeting people that embody joy. And it's like, Oh, it's, it's wonderful. Um, what is it that, that drives you? What is that that gets you up in the morning? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. I had trouble getting up this morning. <laughs> what is it you need to remember <laughs> that drives you to get up in the morning? <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I, I enjoy what I do. I enjoy my work. Even when I don't, even when it's torture and I'm like, I mean, like I, I spent two years writing this book. And it just seemed endless. Mm. It seemed like running a marathon, but it wouldn't let me go. Mm. And uh, I think maybe it's, again, it's information. It's like things that come in and form me into a person who just can't drop it. Right. Like encountering um, injustice and horror mm-hmm. makes me think, yeah, I, I, I can't just let this slide. It's not that... It's not a guilt thing. It's not that I'm only going to be a good person if I do something about it. It's like, you know, if you have like a sick child or, or, or your house is on fire, like you can't just sit there playing Tetris. Mm-hmm. You, 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 you don't feel at ease. Yeah. But I don't know. I'm not like, I would not put myself out there as a role model for, you know, I just, I do my work like everyone else and I'm not sure why really. Hmm. You know, why, why did you ask that question? Because um, I've been feeling a little bit all over the place of late, like not really knowing what the direction that I'm going in or what's going on and just, just feeling just d- uneasy. Um, and it was just the kind of remembering why I'm doing the things that's literally, it was the reminder to myself a couple of days ago, yes, this morning, even really just specifically. And it was for, you know, I have, I deal with depression a lot. It's something that I've dealt a lot with. And one of the main things I do on uplifting content is to talk openly about it so that people feel like it is okay to talk about what you're going through and sort of talk about my journey and the ways and things that are helping. And so it was remembering that the why is I want people to feel, wake up feeling joy not the dread that I feel in those times. And so just, mm. you know, gearing the content and everything that I'm doing uh, t- towards that to like, how can I help as many people as possible wake up feeling joy? And so mm-hmm. I was curious as to what, yeah, what makes you yeah. write that for two years? I don't always wake up feeling joy. <laughs> yeah, you're like, definitely not alone. <laughs> yeah. But I, I'll say uh, depression is something I've thought about a lot and written some things about. And one way to look at depression is that it's a kind of, uh, I use the phrase mutiny of the soul Mm. that says like, so we look at the, the conventional way of seeing depression is that it's, there's something wrong with you. Either there's something wrong with your brain or there's something spiritually wrong with you. But what really depression is, it's a withdrawal from the world. Like you can't make yourself get up or you can't make yourself eat or you can't make yourself stop eating. It's like you feel unmotivated to do anything. Everything seems kind of senseless and meaningless and there's a gray fog around everything. And, and yeah, that seems like a state of poor health. But if 
you question the reality and normality that we're being asked to participate in, then you could say depression is a rebellion against that. It's saying, no, I'm not going to participate in this life that you've prescribed for me and said, here's how to do it. And here's how to be human. And you're supposed to do this, 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 and this. Forget it. I don't feel like it. I'm not, I can't make myself do it anymore. Mm. So it's a pulling back from the world. Mm-hmm. Now the conventional systems sees that as a big problem because it says the world is the right world. You're a, a, a good, well-adjusted person is supposed to participate in it. You're supposed to be motivated. You're supposed to get good grades. You're supposed to get that job. You're supposed to, to be prudent and save your money and make good investments and plan for retirement and yeehaw, then you get to retire and play tennis and golf. Like the, you're supposed to, we're offered a life path and we're offered meaning. But a lot of the things that we're being offered are ruinous to the planet. And if you just can't motivate yourself to participate in these systems, maybe you're healthy. Mm-hmm. Maybe, you're, maybe that's a step in the quest to find something that is worthy of your participation as a noble being. For sure. I, yeah, I a hundred percent agree with you there. Cause usually the, the, the depression comes, you're right. It's, it's things that are happening in the world that I'm like, this is not right. And usually the suffering of other people, injustice, like awful political things that are going on, corruption, that's the type of stuff that mm-hmm. is massively damaging. Um, and then it's also too, when I get caught up in the kind of, just the admin part of work and the just, just the kind of, you know, doing of things with no real meaning, not, mm-hmm. not, not creating, not doing the things that I'm passionate about. So a hundred percent, it is, it is the sign that, nope, this isn't good. <laughs> These are not the things that you should be doing. Follow your bliss, follow your joy, do something of value, take action. Um, and that hundred percent is, is, yeah, I would. Yeah. Or don't take action. Yeah. Like maybe what would happen if you trusted the impulse to not get up in the morning Mm. or you trusted the impulse to just not do that mini stuff? Yeah. Like who knows where that would lead? Yeah. 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 Well, it's interesting because there's (coughs) now I'm in a place where there's times where I have very down days and I'm, and I'm, rather than, you know, stop wasting time. You need to be getting up. You need, rather than giving myself a hard time about it, uh, allow it to be. But then there gets a point where I'm like, all right, this is just really, sometimes I need the kick in the butt to go enough, move in a different direction because like, I don't want to be in this place for any longer. So it's interesting. It's, it's a fine line between like allowing yourself to experience the thing and then when to also kick yourself in the ass because you don't want to be there for any longer. Um, but then I guess that is in itself, uh, that taking that impulse to kick myself in the ass and kicking myself in the ass. So, yeah. I, I, uh, just, I'm just remembering a time I went out in a boat with some friends and there were these seals hanging out on like an abandoned pier, you know, like this kind of hanging out, you know, doing nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then like six hours later, we came back and those seals were still there. <laughs> they did nothing all day. And I was like, wow, there's the struggle to survive, you know? There's like, they feel bad about themselves? No. 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 And yeah. like, why have we become poorer and less free than the seals? That's a really great question. Yeah, like, it's okay to, to just... Enjoy but here's, life. But here's the thing though. Can you feel, do you feel good doing nothing? If like having like no. a week of doing that? Exactly. Like I don't. And so then I look, how much of that is because of programming that Charles, you're a bad boy unless you're productive. Did you do your homework today? Yeah. What have you done lately? And the, the parenting style of giving conditional approval for being productive. Some of it comes from there. Yeah. Some of it might also come from, um, being disconnected from my sole purpose and my mission. Mm. Probably there's some of each, but what I discover is when I'm in that state of quietness and then something comes across my radar that calls to my care, 
then it's almost unstoppable that I take action, mm-hmm. which in my case is, you know, it could be writing something or it could be reaching out to a friend who's, you know, like a friend of mine just, she just, just wrote me, you know, and her, she's having some problem with her husband and her, and her son can't afford college and, you know, you know, and, and, and I had been, I was having a pretty lazy day. But as soon as I saw that email, boom, like I was on it. Mm. And it wasn't, I didn't have to motivate myself. Mm. Like I was, I postponed lunch. You know, I, like that came first. That's the kind of flow that makes all these questions about motivation moot questions. Because like, here's something I care about. Yeah. Yeah. So it's okay to be still and wait Mm -hmm. for the call (laughs) and listen. Yeah. And to trust (laughs) yourself that, yeah, yeah, I'm a person who has gifts that want to be expressed. I want to contribute. I want to be helpful. I know that about myself. I don't have to constantly <clears throat> fight myself to be a good person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, one last question from me, and I'll see if there's any others on the thing there too. Um, h- how do you define success? What's your definition of success? I don't have a definition of success. Okay. And I'm, I'm not really motivated to pursue success. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Fair enough. Sorry about that. It's all right. That's totally fine. Um, for me, I feel like it's living, living your bliss, living your joy, doing the things that you want in life um, and being able to live the life that you want. Um, Ramna says, do you feel joy by following and being part of a routine or by breaking the rules? Hmm. Yeah, you know, maybe I should try the routine thing someday. <laughs> there, there's, for me, there's a certain comfort and safety in a routine that I might actually benefit from. But ordinarily, I am pretty unstructured. Does um, that ever cause any, um, any, any anxiety or worry? Or are you, that's just how you operate um, at that level and sort of whenever things happen, happen. Yeah, it causes anxiety sometimes. And I look at people with neat offices and organized <laughs> drawers, and I think, wow, they're on it. God damn them. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, Charles, thank you so, so very much. Really lovely talking to you. I'm going to uh, find a book winner because it's been very difficult. There's not been very many comments and that's okay. Um, but as I'm doing it on, uh, normally it shows me the, the comments from Facebook as part of Zoom, but that didn't mm-hmm. happen today. So don't mm-hmm. you worry, guys. As soon as we get off, I'm going to pick a winner and send you um, Charles's book, The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible. Um, but yes, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, yeah, where can people um, find out more about you? Um, or whatever it is that you've got, anything else coming up that you just wanted to shout out about before we go? Um, CharlesEisenstein.net, my website. That'll have everything. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, there's th- things on there. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us, everybody. I will see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. for another little chat. Thank you, Charles. Yep. Thank you, Ayana. Yeah.